Well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, and uh, I'll get started with the, a slide I presented last time uh, of why sustainable issues have become so important and why especially uh, sustainable good life is something that we all need to think about uh, because we all want good life. Uh, so these are things I just mentioned uh, last time, and I'll just start with this. So there are five important reasons why sustainability and especially living the good life has become so important. It's always been important, but these five issues coming together have made it uh, more urgent. So resources, uh, the fact that we have limited resources, and uh, of course, the population is large, and the quality of life we all seek requires resources. So resources are something that uh, is a challenge. The fact that the economy is now globally linked, uh, that's another challenge. Uh, healthcare, we want to stay healthy, and people are living longer. Technology is making uh, our lifespans longer. Uh, technology itself, which means the fact that so much of what we thought was work done by humans is now done by technology. It, uh, so humans have to find other ways of finding purpose in life. Uh, so just the fact that they ha you have robots assembling things, things that we thought only humans do that kind of stuff, uh, now technology can do. And this is just the start, because almost everything we think only humans can do these things, more and more machines will be doing them. Uh, so what is the purpose of life? That also becomes very important. Uh, and finally, also everybody wants a good life. Everybody wants a good life. Everybody should have a good life. So one can't have a situation where 20% uh, of the people have a good life and then the rest of the 80% don't have a good life. So everybody deserves a good life, uh, which puts a lot of stress on the system, uh, but yet, uh, if one leads uh, a certain style of life, that is very possible. So with that, I'm just going to continue. Uh, and I'll also show you another thing I just mentioned because a very useful way of looking at a sustainable good life is looking at food as a metaphor for good life. Right? So food um, has many elements and we often think of food as here's a pyramid of food, right? So you, you've all heard of the pyramid of food, which is really not enough, uh, but it's a good start. So when we consume food, there are many kinds of foods that we need to consume to have a sustainable good life. We can't say we'll only eat uh, steaks and ca only you know, have caviar and champagne. We won't have anything else. We need to eat vegetables. We need to eat other things. Uh, so when we have food, there are many layers uh, of what we need to consume. And I had shown you this uh, kind of basket of good life, and I'm showing, going to show you again, because uh, some of the things are similar to what I showed, and then a few other things are going to be added. And with every lecture, I'll bring one more thing to add to this thing. So you've seen this last time, uh, and of course it has some elements of food. So you have some vegetables, you have some fruits, uh, you have some nuts, it, uh, hopefully you're not allergic to peanuts. You have some cashews, uh, some onions, uh, some ginger. Uh, but then you also have, well, they have some lentils out here, uh, some rice. Uh, all of these elements have to be part of good life, right? uh, part of good eating. Uh, then also, uh, there are spices. Right? So spices are also a very important part of good life. There's some ginger. Uh, so. Just like food has to have many, many layers to make food interesting, make food delicious, and sustainable. Right? So food is something which provides us a perfect way of looking at good life. Right? In the same way, our own life should have many, many layers which provide us a um, sense of purpose and good life. Uh, <clears throat> I also showed you last time a very important part of food is a, a toothbrush and a toothpaste and floss being able to release the residue of eating. And that's also a very important part of good life. So coming along, going along with those, there are seven layers of good life, which come from looking at life from a yoga point of view uh, and interpreting those. So I mentioned last time also, physical wellness, we all want to stay healthy. We don't want, want to be unhealthy. We want to have a safe shelter, uh, decent source of nutrition, 
Uh, we want to have good health. We don't want to be in pain, right? So that if you're in pain, all the rest of the stuff goes away. You may be very wealthy. You may even have uh, a lot of friends, but if you're constantly in pain, so one of the things is physical wellness. Then creativity, being able to create something. Uh, if you can't create something, you still don't feel fulfilled. You want to create something. You want to create beauty. You want to create some art, some music. So creativity is also part of good life. Uh, then having a multi-dimensional uh, living where you are doing many things in life. You have a social life, you have an intellectual life, you have a spiritual life, so having balance in life. Right? So that's also part of good life. Uh, then having love in your life. Right? So we all understand the role of love, connections to others, having uh, positive connections to other people who care for us, we care for them. That's also part of good life. So you can see that just like food, there are many layers that we need uh, in our life. And then being able to express yourself. If you are unable to express yourself, that also is reflecting poorly on how good your life is. Being able to express yourself. What is in your heart, what's in your mind, being able to say it, express it, either as speech, poetry, writing, literature, whatever. Being able to express yourself. Then knowing yourself. So having an understanding of who am I? Right? What makes me special? Because all of us are special, so who am I? What is unique about myself? Am I nurturing that uniqueness? Or am I just following the herd? Right? That's a very important part of good life because you're not going to get this life again. Right? Uh, you have these days in, uh, in this universe, uh, in this world, knowing yourself and pursuing your uniqueness. Right? So that's very important. Also. Uh, so self-reflection, contemplation, that's part of good life. So allocating resources, which means time for such things. And finally, uh, feeling part of the universe, feeling spirituality, seeing yourself reflected in others, in the universe, being able to enjoy nature, being able to enjoy stars. So according to this description, uh, which comes in a metaphorical sense, in a poetic sense from yoga, but I've interpreted it for in a language that makes sense, you can see that all of these, and most of us will agree, yeah, we need this. Just like we, most of us agree that I need some carrots in my food, I need some uh, spices, I need some turmeric for my brain, I need some ginger to keep my blood healthy, all these things are part. So similarly, uh, you need all this uh, stuff to make a sustainable good life. And the interesting thing is that while the physical wellness does require a lot of resources, some of the higher level wellnesses don't require a lot of resources. So if you'll say uh, love, it's, you don't have to burn gasoline to have love. Right? So you can have love without that. So as you go to higher levels of good life, uh, the resources you need are become less and less. And also the, you feel more fulfilled. And the great thing is that now there's a lot of scientific evidence, a lot of empirical studies, uh, double blind studies properly done. Uh, and University of Michigan is one of the top in doing these studies. They also show that just like food needs several layers, good life also needs several layers. Right? So this is part, so having friends enhances your health. It's now established through a lot of studies. So we need all this. Uh, and so technology, of course, is something that helps us because good life is not handed to us. Uh, cars are not given to us. They don't grow on trees. We have to actually fabricate them in some. Uh, this, this laser prime pointer I have didn't fall out of uh, a bird, right? So somebody had to go make it. The technology is part of establishing and reaching the good life, right? So our bodies, our minds have limitations. Um, so we don't have a genie just kind of, you know, asking a genie, give me this, give me this. It doesn't happen. Somebody has to make, somebody has to create technology. And one of the things that in this series I want to look at is, how does technology help us achieve good life? Right? So technology can be looked upon from many, many different things. Uh, technology can be looked upon, I, I, I want a 200 gigahertz radar system, provide me that radar system, and technologies will work and produce that radar system. However, we want to look, especially in this series, in how does technology help those seven layers of good life that I described. Uh, so te technology extends our physical limits, extends the power of our brain, our brawn, uh, it extends our senses. Uh, we can listen to conversations going on in, um, across the world. Right? We can call somebody in Beijing, talk to them. So things that 
normally we just cannot imagine doing, technology has made it magically possible. <coughs> so today, if you ask, so this is an interesting thing, and in fact, if you have conversations, and I have two sons, and when I'm talking to them, it's like such a strange feeling, because you can ask a 10-year-old today to answer any of these questions, and within minutes he'll answer, he or she will answer these questions. You can ask, even if the person may not know, the child may not know what barium is, they can find out how many electrons barium has, can, how does photosynthesis work, uh, how many inches have the mountains, Himalayas sunk in the last 50 years, what's the second law of thermodynamics, what's the Haber cycle to fix nitrogen, uh, and what I'm going to talk about a little bit, how, what are the milestones in digital technology, the child can answer. Because the child can just pick out uh, a smartphone, uh, dial up some websites, go to Wikipedia, and give you all the answers. Right? So it's amazing how much intelligence has been created by technology. Um, and so I'm not going to focus on what are the milestones in digital technology, because there are websites describing all that. Right? So I'm not going to focus on that. What I'm going to focus on is how is technology helped us, and where are the gaps in technology? Right? So where are the gaps where Technology can contribute to good life because a lot of times technology is developed for reasons that are not good life, for reasons that are very important, uh, but maybe not part of looking at things from the good life perspective. So what I want to do is look at things from the point of view of good life uh, perspective. So here I have a little uh, packet here, which I'm going, to, I'm going to show you. So as part of food, of course you need something else, and I have a faucet here. Right? So, uh, and actually a lot of what we talk about in technology is just this thing, just this thing. It's, it's, in technology we don't call it a faucet, we call it a MOSFET. Right? Uh, so we call it a transistor. But that's, that's so important. Right? So for food, it's also important for intelligence. So I'm going to talk about this uh, guy here where you open and close. So this is the gate of the MOSFET and you have water flowing. Right? Uh, so I'm going to talk a lot about this, but this is very important because, of course, a farmer needs this also. Right? To make uh, uh, food, you need a faucet, you need irrigation system, and in the age of intelligence, we need the same thing. Right? We need uh, the transistor. Um, I'm going to also show you uh, a little part of this faucet. This is a washer. Right? So tiny. Without the washer, this faucet won't work. Right? Uh, and for the longest time. Uh, Technologists have been thinking, when will the washer break down? Right? Uh, you may have heard of Moore's Law, so I'll, I'll talk about this. When will the washer break down and this faucet won't work? And we've been waiting for that period, and that period get, keeps getting extended because technologists are so clever. So I'm going to continue. Uh, <clears throat> so the point is that intelligence has become so pervasive. In this room, there's so much intelligence, right? not just from people who are here, but in the air. Because you can, any of you can pick up your smartphone and surf the internet for all kinds of facts and figures. Right? So one can ask, what is the value of information now? Right? So uh, if I say, you know, how do I place value on in information? Because information is everywhere. And uh, it, it's sometimes very frustrating because I'm talking to my sons, and as I'm talking, they're verifying what I'm saying. Right? So, and they catch me right away. Right, so they're sitting with their blackberries and oh, dad is saying this, this. No, you know, that's not correct. Because here it says that's not correct. So it's very frustrating. But, and, and yet they, they're not electrical engineers. They, they don't have the education I have, because uh, they're young. Uh, but they can stop me. So it's a really interesting conversation. And some of you may have similar experiences that you start talking and you think you know what you're saying. And, all the time you've been corrected by you know a child uh, so what is the value of information what is the value of knowledge what is the value of wisdom what's the value of action being able to act on knowledge and what's the value of stress release right? uh, what's the value of acceptance so these things of course in technology we usually don't talk about but these things are very very important for good life right? uh, so Technology has provided us information, it's provided us knowledge, but beyond that, technology is kind of stuck. And so what we need to ask further is, what additional things should technology bring 
to, from, to bring the good life into our living. So uh, with that, I want to describe to you, uh, again, this comes from yoga, looking at, uh, it, and it's a universal principle. Right? So if yoga is stripped of certain things, then it provides a, a infrastructure just like science. It's like empirical science. You also provide an infra, in, uh, sort of a, a structure. And there are, one can ask, to make a sustainable life's journey, any journey, whether you want to open a business, you want to have a family, you, are, you have children, you want to have good relations with your children, anything, yoga provides a structure of how to do it, which are like best practices. Right? So how does one take a journey, whether it's a car journey or a personal journey or getting a degree, uh, getting anything uh, in life. So yoga provides these eight rules. Uh, the first part is know the rules of the game. Right? So if you take a journey, know the rules of the game. Uh, what are the rules I'm going to operate in? Right? So if you're going to play soccer and the rules you know are those of cricket, you're going to constantly make mistakes. Right? So you're going to be constantly uh, fouling up, getting penalties, and you think, what's going on? So the first thing is to know the rules of the game. And technology has been fantastic in providing us rules of the game. Right? So we have GPS systems, we have guidance systems, we have all kinds of things to provide us. So it's done a very good job there, providing us the rules of the game. We know how to eat, what are good things to eat. So we know, know a lot of things that uh, technology provides. So the rules of the game, technology has done a great job. Infrastructure, so the second thing is infrastructure. If you want to take a journey, we want to drive a car, you need some roads, you need some bridges, you need some lights, you need some other things. So you need some infrastructure right, to take a journey. Otherwise, the journey becomes very costly because if you're driving a car and there are no roads, you get stuck in the mud, uh, you fall into a ditch, right? all kinds of things can happen. So having infrastructure. Third thing, which is very important any journey, is in the journey, there'll be so many stresses. Right? So how do you respond to stress? And that's a place where technology has not done very much. Right? So how do you respond? Somebody shouts at you, how do you respond? You get angry, you, you fail at something, you get despondent, you get sad, how do you respond? Right? So that part, technology has not made much contribution. And I'll point out later on why that is so, so important knowing how to deal with stress. And I think all of us understand the role of stress. Stress is going to be there everywhere. Right? And how do you respond to stress? Right? There are stresses from relationships, stresses from jobs, stresses from uh, your bank, your taxes are coming up, all kinds of stresses are there. How do you respond to stress? Right? So that's a very important part uh, where technology, so this reds are where technology has not quite made much of an uh, indent. So, Next one is fuel for the journey. You need some energy, you need some fuel uh, to go, to, to take a journey from point one to point two. You need some fuel for the journey. And technology has been pretty good. We have cars, we have airplanes, we have all kinds of things. There are other resources also. Uh, then the next one is being aware of yourself. What are my unique talents? What's my uniqueness? What do I bring to this journey so I can take the journey in the most efficient, the best possible way? Uh, awareness of myself, then awareness of the outer world, the world I live in. What, uh, how does the world respond? I want to be a musician, how will the world respond? Where is, are the best resources? So understanding the inside world and understanding the outside world. Uh, the next one is mindfulness. Right? So mindfulness, staying in the moment, staying in the moment. Uh, and our mind is so wandering. Mind is the hardest thing to control. It just wanders and wanders and wanders. It doesn't enjoy the moment. It doesn't realize this is the moment that you have. Instead, it looks at past, future, all kinds of things, wanders all over. And so mindfulness is an important part. And the last one, just like I showed you the floss and the toothbrush, being able to release whatever you accumulate. Because when we take a journey, there's always a residue from the journey. You eat the best foods, you still have some residue on your teeth. You have to remove that residue. So being able to release the residue of the journey, and that is very, very difficult. In the journey, you might fail, uh, you might do wonderfully well, you might uh, be insulted, you might have shame, guilt, all kinds of things will be accumulated in the journey, and being able to release that. And there is really no technology yet which allows you to release that. Right? So, 
What this shows is there are several areas where technology can make a lot of impact. Now, of course, technology has to be very, very clever, and people designing it and people using it have to be extremely clever to produce these technologies because we don't think in this way. We don't think, let me design a chip that will allow one to release their anger or release their guilt. We don't think that way. We think, well, that's not technology, but why not? Right? So that's what one of some of the things I want to explore. Why not? Right? Why should technology only allow me to call somebody in Beijing, uh, diagonalize a million by million matrix, uh, break codes from all over, all kind of things technology does. Why not these other things? Right? And the reason is simply we haven't thought about it. Right? So we can do it. Right? So that's uh, both for the users of technology who, de who may demand this, because technology is always made up of technologists and users. So there's a push-pull. So both have to work. People who uh, are using technology have to ask for such, such technology, and people who produce it have to come up with uh, new ideas. So uh, I'll take a quick review of uh, this, uh, this uh, faucet used in age of intelligence, which is the MOSFET, right, or the transistor. In general, transistors, diodes, all kind of intelligent devices that have been made. So one has to pay respects to Mr. Schrodinger, who came up with this equation, Schrodinger equation, uh, without which really there would be no semiconductor technology. Right? So one has to, uh, so when Schrodinger said, and of course before that some others also, but he finally put this equation together saying that particles are waves. Right? So this is basically one part of quantum mechanics, came up with the idea that uh, to explain certain things, you have to believe or have to accept that particles behave as waves. So this is the Schrodinger equation. And only certain electron energies are allowed. So I'm not going to dwell on the te technical part so much, but it's important to recognize how technology comes about. So a lot of basic science goes into technology. Right? So a lot of physics, a lot of chemistry has gone into technology. and uh, Fundamental science of physics and chemistry is essential in technology. And to develop new technologies, also fundamental science has to be there. Without that, we don't know the rules of the game. Right? So science, and science provides it, and technology uses it. So going further, this is again just a, a little band diagram, which I'm not going to spend too much time. But because of that Schrodinger equation applied to materials, uh, one finds in semiconductors, free electron holes densities can be controlled, just like this faucet's uh, head can control the flow of water, right? So that's basically the concepts that came out of it, uh, that you can make a device which can switch, can amplify, can do all kind of operations. Uh, so that was um, just a quick overview. Uh, so with that, of course, one had, before that, there were transistors, there were vacuum tubes. And uh, if you came to this uh, building maybe 10 years ago, uh, there was a huge machine sitting there, which was uh, you know, made a computer. The, one of the ENIAC com computers used to sit there. It's not there anymore. Uh, but vacuum tubes were what was used before in doing these kind of switching. Uh, and then, of course, the transistor was invented. Um, so these are the gentlemen who produced the first transistor, um, which changed the world, which changed the world. Right? So it's essentially uh, it's a very classic uh, photograph from Bell Labs. <coughs> Beyond that, this device I just described, I, and I'm not going to describe this technically so much, but the MOSFET was created with the work of a lot of very, very smart people, and the MOSFET is basically this uh, faucet here. Just like the faucet is needed to irrigate, uh, the MOSFET can do a lot of things. It's irrigating our mind by providing us information, doing calculations for us, uh, doing all kind of uh, fun things for us. So the MOSFET, just like a faucet, uh, and that just launched the age of uh, technology based on semiconductors. And that, along with the Boolean algebra, understanding that if you have switches, you can produce digital technology. You can do anything you want. You can manipulate numbers. You can add, subtract, multiply, do things that our brain is just not capable of doing very fast. And uh, so that's with the Boolean al algebra. And uh, you can produce switches, low power, high power. right? So you can have extremely high power switches. You can have very switches that turn on by a child's touch. Right? So you can have all kind of devices. 
digital, di digital devices, analog devices, and that essentially started this technology race, and of course it's continuing. You see this, picture, this uh, bust outside our building, uh, and that's uh, Claude Shannon. And he was instrumental in providing the guidance, how do you code data, right? So if you haven't seen it, just outside our building uh, is uh, Mr. Shannon, who was one of the students here right, um, at the University of Michigan. Uh, how do you code? How do you send data? And this essentially was essential for networks. So communication networks, internet, all kind of things have developed. Cell phones, you can call people anywhere. So this was the start, and then of course the whole field developed. So many people have contributed, uh, and the person I find the most intriguing is Gordon Moore, because he came up with this idea of Moore's law, which is not a law at all as we understand it. You know, we understand Newton's law, we understand, well, here is Schrodinger's equation, here is Dirac equation. We understand laws as natural laws, but he produced something just amazing. Right? If, uh, you know, if, if sometimes one thinks, you know, as a, as a scientist, you often think, you know, if I was in that situation, what would I do? Like, you know, you think, you know, if I was, a, I was Newton and an apple fell on my head. Now they say apple never really fell on Newton's head. But suppose apple fell on my head, would I come up with the law of gravity? Right? So you sometimes put yourself, especially as a scientist, you'd like to put yourself in different scientists' state of mind, and you think, you know, what would I have done if uh, somebody came with photoelectric effect to me and said, explain it? You know, would I have come up with what Einstein came up with? And you wonder. And one thing I know I could have never come up with was Moore's law. It's like just so amazing. It's so amazing that, and, and essentially, Moore's, the, the law was first produced just a few years after transistors, and he saw some observation, and he came, came up with Moore's law, which was later slightly very uh, modified, but he said functionality will double every eight months, transistor density will double every two years. Right? How did he come up with this? I mean, he made some observation, but that observation is still valid after 50 years, and that law, has become even more important than law of gravity for technologists. Okay, so people who work in clean rooms, for them, this is the company started believing that if we don't obey Moore's law, we'll die. And we teach courses in this uh, department, and we look at Moore's law as we have to do everything we can do to make sure Moore's law is not violated. It's like God's law. So it's amazing how powerful this law has become and how much transformation it has caused. Right? So essentially everything we do now, at the beginning of the talk, I gave you those questions that a child can answer. Right? Those questions would not have been answered if Moore's law was not there. Right? So Moore's law has been amazing. And uh, what I would like to think is this was a, a role not just by technologists but users. Right? So, can similar laws be created to create the good life? Right? Can we produce new Moore's laws, Moore's laws, not to double transistors, right? So Moore's already has his imprint on that, but doing other things. And I'll describe to you six or seven new Moore's law. And I would encourage all of us to work towards those Moore's law. Uh, so at the end of the talk, I'll give you three new Moore's laws. And we'll try to see if we can fulfill them. So <clears throat> keep in mind, Moore's law is not a physical law. It's an outcome of users and technologists working together. So how did Moore's law happen? And I'm not going to go through the history, but a number of things happen. And it's very important to appreciate the role of the users in Moore's law. Right? If the users didn't accept technology, Moore's law would not have happened. Right? So not only technologists work to produce Moore's law, which made the transistor smaller and smaller and smaller, but the users accepted Moore's law. And there's Moore's law going on somewhere here, <laughs> somebody's phone. <laughs> so the role of users is very, very critical. People who use technology are as important as people who produce technology. Because without users, what I could produce the most fabulous in integrated circuit. Nobody wants it. Right? So what do I do with it? So users play a very important role. And these new kind of so if users demand the good life, technologists will have to respond. 
and the technologists will be challenged then to play a better role. Right? So we've produced you know, 300 gigahertz transistors that you can't even dream of, and they are there. They are radar systems, communication systems, uh, and we fulfill that. And if users demand the good life, technology for good life, that will also happen. So the ARPANET, uh, I found this picture of uh, Bill Gates. Uh, and I don't know if it's a hoax or if it's real, but uh, at least according to the website, it's real. In Wikipedia, it's, it says it's real. That he was arrested in New Mexico. And look at his face, he's so happy. <laughs> so, <laughs> for a traffic violation. <laughs> he didn't do anything real bad, you know. He just probably drove his car too fast. Um, but, you know, these people have also played an immense role in technology. Uh, by driving technology, making it a part of everyday experience. Right? So if technology was still just at IBM, in insurance companies and automobile companies, the fact that technology came to the user the democratization of technology, that's what made Moore's Law happen. So Moore's Law would not have happened if the PC didn't happen, if the phone technologies didn't change. So there are so many things that people wanted these technologies and technologists delivered. So at this point, you know what this is. Some of you came and you know what this is. So I'm going to have all of you Celebrate the power of the user, the power of the individual by performing laughter yoga. So let's uh, stand up. And uh, so you have to, and just make yourself feel light and happy and you know, it's a good time to stretch. So I'm gonna take you through a few movements and I'm gonna teach you the a breath which is uh, used, there are so many breaths that are used in yoga. There are like 500 styles of breathing. I'm going to take you through one of them. The first one we'll do, we'll do it without laughing and then we'll laugh, right? So, so just uh, stand with your heels touching if you're comfortable and uh, pulling your shoulders back, open your chest. Stand like a warrior, like you're a warrior, like afraid of nothing. Bring your hands forward and touch your fingers and pull your shoulders back and open your heart. Like literally, you can open your heart if you want, right? So heart is open, it's light, it's loving. And we'll bring our arms to the sides and reach up towards the sky, inhaling, then come back, exhaling. And we'll inhale for about six, seven seconds, exhale for about six, seven seconds. So let's inhale. Reaching up. And exhale back. Do one more. Feel you're growing so tall. And you look beautiful. So now we'll do the laughter yoga. So when we inhale, we'll do the same thing. When we exhale, we'll just burst out laughing. Right? Totally burst out laughing. So let's do three of those. So pull your shoulders back and let's inhale up. Get ready. <laughs> and need more laughter. Let's inhale. And louder. <laughs> and one more. And with all your strength. <laughs> Okay, you can shake your shoulders, just stretch, and have a seat. And we'll continue. So you can see the power of laughter, and you can do it anywhere. There's no charge. Uh, you don't pay anything, right? So it costs nothing, and you can do it with your friends. You can even do it by yourself and look silly. You can do it in the diag by yourself and look silly. That's totally fine. Okay, let's uh, continue. So there were many challenges. Uh, there are still many challenges placed in the path of Moore's Law. Um, so there are challenges coming from basic physics, which we call intrinsic carrier density, uh, which leads to leakage. So uh, the challenges are primarily coming from various things, but mainly this washer here. So this uh, faucet, so people have been saying for years, this, this washer will break down. It, it's not going to help. So the, if the washer breaks down, you know what happens. The water keeps flowing, right? So there is what we call leakage. So say it's a leaky faucet. So, 
for years, of course, we've been waiting for that end of Moore's Law, where we think the Moore's Law will end. Uh, and 10 years ago, I think the predictions were close to now that Moore's Law will end. Uh, but Moore's Law hasn't ended, because people are very clever. Right? People are very clever. And um, so uh, things coming from basically things like intrinsic carrier concentration, which uh, students who have taken courses here probably know, um, should know. But in fact, Moore's Law still continues. Because people are looking at Moore's Law like, if Moore's Law falls apart, entire electrical engineering department will collapse. Right? Uh, it won't happen, but that's our mentality. We think that way. And because we think that way, it happens. Moore's Law is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So um, for years, we've been thinking, this is the end of Moore's Law. Right? So, the faucet is just like burst open, right? So it's like the hydrant can't stop. We've been thinking our switches will just be so leaky, they won't be able to control the uh, water flow. But this is the new Intel, you may have seen this, uh, 22 nanometer transistor where they made a three-dimensional structure. Right? So instead of a planar structure. Uh, and in fact, people are very, very clever. They're finding all kinds of ways to keep Moore's Law going. And with this and what are called high K dielectric constant materials changing the washer, the kind of material you use for the washer instead of this rubber, something else. Right? So Moore's law is continuing. And in fact, Intel's next fab line will be 14 nanometer, which in one of the directions is only 25 atoms. Right? So even at 25 atoms, people are totally confident we'll continue Moore's law. And most people and it seems very reasonable that at least six more generations are there for Moore's Law. So what that has done has made, of course, amazing things. Uh, new materials are being added in. And this is just a little bit of technology. New materials are coming in. Uh, new sensors, new switches, new logic elements are being added into traditional things, uh, semiconductors. Uh, here's the nitride which I'll talk a little bit more in the next lecture, some of the new materials that are being folded in to enhance technology even further. Um, <clears throat> and new kind of devices are coming in. It's the semiconductor technology is being married to many other technologies to produce entirely new technologies. Right? So one is branching off Moore's law into other directions uh, to produce new technologies. Uh, so this is like the traditional uh, transistor, then pressure sensors, Temperature sensors, this is just a schematic. Devices that are intelligent can sense pressures, can sense humidity, can sense uh, uh, chemicals, all kind of chemicals, so become chemical sensors, uh, magnetic sensors, and eventually human health sensors, sensors that can sense. And that's what I'm really interested in for you guys to produce, uh, and I would love to use such a thing, a sensor that senses that I'm getting angry and tells me calm down, and makes me do the laughter yoga we just did. So that's what I want, where when I get mad, when I get upset, if I get stressed, if I get a little uh, sad, a sensor will sense it and say, stand up and do this laughter yoga. Right? It'll immediately reset me. So that's what I want. Um, but those, some of these devices are not here yet. So, but semiconductors have been married to so many other materials, and entirely new technologies have been produced. And um, I want to show Dr. Wise, Professor Wise from our department, uh, who essentially created this wedding, right? a wedding between, uh, uh, and I understand he can officiate weddings. Right? Uh, that's my understanding that he can officiate weddings. But he officiated this wedding between silicon and piezoelectrics, and uh, this department is really well known for uh, technologies in MEMS, sensors, those kind of things, right? which have uh, started. And these are all from University of Michigan, which I, uh, thanks to the power of internet, you can pull out from anywhere and put them. Uh, so new technologies have developed and they'll continue to develop. Right? So there's almost no end to what technologies can do. They can almost create magic. Right? If you understand the science, physics, understand materials, you can create all these uh, amazing things. Uh, and of course, technology has provided us this infrastructure of high performance computing, high performance communication systems, high performance access to data, access to knowledge, all of that has, been, has happened. One may start asking, well, what next? What do we do next? Right? And that's really, one has to ask how much of this has contributed to our good life? And a lot has, right? a lot has. 
We've been affected by this, but a lot has not been affected. Right? So there's a huge opportunity. So technology is like a hammer. You can build a house. You can also knock somebody on the head. You can do anything you want with technology. So technology is not automatically guaranteed to produce a good life. The user has to understand what good life is and uh, use it appropriately or create new technology. So of course technology is going beyond uh, just computing. Uh, there is the brainwave technology where, in fact, uh, this is, I, I read yesterday, I heard yesterday on one of the news bulletins that uh, there are physicians who were operating on some patients and with their permission they wired them with some of these new sensors that come from technology where they were thinking of certain words and they could read the words on a computer. Right? So actually making words and being able to read it from the brain because these people were not speaking. Uh, so the brain technology, brainwave technology is becoming, in fact you can buy these and play games, you can play video games on with controlling the game with your brain. Right? So this is already there. Uh, but does it make our life good? kind of doubtful. I have uh, a son who loves, loves uh, playing games, but I don't think his life is really being enhanced by pay, playing so many games. You know, maybe a little bit is okay. Uh, so technology is something that is there, and one has to look at you know, where is it contributing. There are all kinds of new materials that are coming. There are organic materials coming in, carbon nanotubes, graphene, all kinds of new things. And so there's no end to technology. The kind of thing we think, well, we've reached the limit. If Moore's law even reaches its limit, that is not going to stop technology. We know that because when we look at sensors, uh, when we look at magnetic materials, they are going to come into technology and produce entirely new things. So almost anything we wish for can be produced by technology. Right? So, uh, except, what do we wish for? So when we look at uh, chips, uh, computer chips, uh, are they going to be ever as smart as us? Now, the human brain is an amazing uh, piece of uh, uh, material. It, uh, it's uh, amazing. In some areas, our brain does operations. So our brain consumes about 10 watts of power, right? So on an average, when you think really hard, it might consume a little more. But it's around 10 watts of power, right? Uh, uh, which is not much. You know, simple light bulb uh, can consume a few, uh, 10, 100 watts of power. So our brain only consumes 10 watts of power. But in some areas, some computation and some kind of uh, intelligence, there's a, it does things that are equivalent, equivalent of performing 100 petaflops of computation. Uh, so a petaflop is doing 10 to the 15 operations per second. So doing things 10 to the 15 operations per second. So uh, in some areas, like face recognition, Right? So we recognize people, we pull out, we connect smells, right? So we can smell something, create a whole image around that smell. So in some areas, our brain does just amazing things. And there is today no computer that can do that, right? reach that. But in some areas, it's really poor. Right? And of course, in some of those areas, technology has really helped. Right? So we can't add, subtract very well. So a simple uh, $2 calculator can do much, it much better, and that's really helped us. So there are, what technologists also need to look is, where are gaps? We can, of course, compete with the brain, try to do image recognition, face recognition, and people are doing it, and that's fantastic. But there are several areas of the brain where it's still very, very poor, and technology has not done much about it. So we can't calculate very well, but technology is there to calculate very well. So that's, of course, fantastic. Just for comparison, uh, Roadrunner, which is one of IBM's computer, it does 1.8 petaflop, so you know, 100 petaflop. Now the brain, of course, works in a completely different way, but equivalent of, so this computer does 1.8 petaflops. It occupies 6,000 square foot feet of space. Right? Uh, so this room is, uh, say, about 400 square feet. So this computer today, uh, which is at Los Alamos, occupies 6,000 square feet and consumes 2.35 megawatts. So 2.35 million watts. The brain consumes only 10 watts. Right? In fact, from projections, if digital technology worked as it is, to work at the level of the brain in this, to do exactly what the brain does, like recognizing people, uh, bringing out memories, all these things, uh, it's 
projected that the computer will actually need a terawatt of power. It's pretty much suck out all the power. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of uh, reports say that if such computers are designed and used, they'll produce more harm to the climate than anything else we do. Of course, they are designed to study climate, but they'll produce so much harm because they'll consume terawatts of power. Uh, so, of course. But that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done. Right? So it's just one has to see where are we going. So without new architectures, of course, there's very little chance that we'll have a gadget, that I'll have a gadget in my hand that will do what my brain can do. Right? On the other hand, there are so many things that the brain is really poor at. So if you look at a monarch butterfly, and this is the time where the monarchs are in California, so I love to go and see them. Uh, if you look at a monarch butterfly, it flies this is one of the patterns. They do many patterns. But they fly from Colorado, just five trees in Santa Barbara. Just five trees. They make it all the way. Uh, and also, interestingly, none of the butterfly has ever made that path. It has never flown that path. Because its lifespan is too small. Right? So the time it takes to go there, nest, come back, it's too long. So none of the butterflies has actually made that path. And yet they land on those five trees. Look at the guidance systems. Look at the intelligence of the biology right, that they have. Uh, so of course, our brain is far more than that. But our brain is prehistoric. So now I want to show you some of the things that our brain is totally terrible at. Right? So we can do peta, 100 peter flops of uh, com computation, but our brain, so you know the incredible Hulk. Right? Uh, so there are critical parts which are needed in good life, which our brain is really bad at. And that's where technology needs to make more impact. Of course, yoga deals with those parts, right? So if you practice yoga, that's exactly what yoga tries to do. Except yoga takes a long time. Right? So you have to practice for years and years. And even then, sometimes you'll lose your mind and say, oh, gosh, I learned all this, and it's down the drain. So technology, that's the great thing about technology. It can democratize. It can teach you very fast. It can make things available to you. So let's just quickly review where the brain is so pre prehistoric. So in some areas, our response to stress is still primitive, right? So uh, we often get angry. You know, we, somebody says something, we get angry. Why do we get angry? So think about it. Why do we get angry? Like somebody just uh, calls you something and you get mad. Why do we get mad? There's no reason. Right? The person just said something. Like you don't get mad if a bird chirps. So why do we get mad? Uh, because our brain is so prehistoric. So we see fears, because we're still like cavemen and cave women in many ways, and worse than cavemen and cave women, because they knew how to deal with stress. So we are still wired as if we are living 100,000 years ago. Right? So in a lot of areas, we don't know how to deal with stress. So we still fear shadows. We have xenophobia. You know, we, have, we have racism. Still, right? why? And all of the things are really bad for having a sustainable good life. Right? Technology has made no impact over there, right? or very little impact. We still get anxious. Why do we get anxious? Right? Because nothing happens by getting worried and anxious. Nothing happens. Our brain knows that. Intelligently, we know that. But when we are under stress, we completely transform. Right? And that still happens. So that part of our brain, technology has done nothing. We still have very hard time releasing stress. Right? So if some things bad happen at, in the day, we can't sleep. Right? And that's awful for us. Right? So normally when we think the brain should do things that are good for us, but the brain th does things that are really bad for us. And we all know that. We wish we didn't have to think. So if something, somebody says something to us, we are thinking all through the night. It bothers us. We are upset. Uh, next day it bothers us. Why? Right? So obviously, it's not something that is good for us, but there's no technology to release it. Right? Now, in yoga, of course, there are a lot of techniques to release that. Right? So yoga, in some ways, is um, like I think, like to think of it as like the floss. Right? So just like a floss can pull out all the residues, you know, if you don't have floss, it's pretty hard. So, but they, they can be, and that's one of the things I'm very excited about, because considering what technology can do, if we know how to integrate certain elements from yoga and other practices into technology, it can be a very, very powerful tool. Uh, which means things like upsetting you, you can release them quickly. And that's a big part of. So technology has not contributed much to the most critical part 
of our brain, which is needed for the good life. And that's a big challenge for technology. So in spite of uh, all the advances, all the intelligence, we still have not touched that part of the brain. And so that offers huge opportunities for technology. So just to go over again the eight steps in taking a holistic journey. Right? So this comes also in a way written in, a, so it's like an eight limbed practice. Right? So the first rules of the game. Technology has done a great job there. So one can say we can give four out of five to technology for what it has done in telling us what the rules of the game are. So technology is really done amazing things. 100 years ago, there were so many things we didn't know. Right? You got sick, you thought, you know, why did I get sick? Um, maybe the God is upset at me. Um, you think of all kinds of things. Maybe somebody put a curse on me, and now they say, well, no. Actually, I'll just give you this, uh, take this pill, and you're fine. Right? So there are so many things. We understand diseases better. There are still some diseases we don't understand. But there are so many things technology and science and knowledge has brought us. But there are still some more. Right? We still don't understand why certain cancers arise, but you know, that's, technology will work on it, science will work on it. In the infrastructure area, technology has done fantastic things. We have amazing things which help us guide through our journey. But the third element is how do you deal with stress? There is really no worthwhile journey which will not have stress. Right? The only journeys which will have no stress are worthless. Right? So they're, basically, you're not growing. Right? The moment you want to grow, the moment you want to be outside your comfort zone, which means grow, you'll have stress. And technology has not provided us any guidance there. Right? So people are just kind of building up stress. So we know, for example, that in the US, uh, the most prescribed drug is for depression. And there are some cases where depression is clinically, you need some things, but in so many areas, the depression is basically inability to deal with stress. So stress is coming from all sorts of places. Uh, so there are so many places where our inability, so one looks at uh, one of the most dangerous places, uh, the home. And I was reading the other day that in the US, every 15 seconds, there's a domestic abuse case. So more than a million people suffer from domestic abuse. Why? People don't know how to deal with stress. So one or the other person doesn't know how to deal with stress. Right? So dealing with stress is a huge issue in good life and running a journey. If we don't know how to do it, the technology is, one would say, one out of four, five, if that. Right? So there's a huge opportunity to build technology for one, training how to do, so in education, how do you deal with stress? What's the value of being angry? What's the cost of being angry? Right? So when you get angry, what's the cost to you? What's the cost to your health, to your personal health, your social health? So there's a huge opportunity of understanding stress, how to release stress, and that should be part of our daily living, understanding and releasing stress. Then fuel for the journey. Technology has done a great job, right? We have um, ability to move which we didn't have before. So certainly fuel, that's very good. Self-awareness, again, technology has not done too much. So one often says contemplation, because that requires sitting still. And technology is actually quite opposite. It kind of makes our mind more and more agitated, right? So we have emails running, Blackberries chirping, uh, all kind of Twitters going on. So it distracts us. So we don't have time to contemplate. So, but contemplation is a very important part of our journey. Because if you don't know yourself, then you're taking a journey that is guided by somebody else. Right? And so you're just a cog, right? So you're just moving along with the herd. Somebody's saying, do this, do this, do this. And they say, no, now do this, right? So you don't know what you're doing. So contemplation, uh, that is another important part. And technology can be helpful because there are techniques that are needed for contemplation. It's not easy to, do, to meditate, for example. There are techniques, and it is expensive to go to a teacher and say, you know, teach me meditation. Technology can do similar things. Right? One thinks, how can a technology teach meditation? And we used to ask similar things. How can technology type? Right? We used to ask that, you know, uh, so many jobs that used to be there, people used to think, you know, there's no way technology is going to take over, but why not? Right? So, Everybody should have access to tools that teach you how to meditate. 
Everybody should have access to tools that allow you to release stress. And of course, the best first preference is a human being, but often that's not possible. Right? So why not technology? So <clears throat> then awareness of the outer world channel, and technology has done a pretty good job right? teaching us about the outer world. Right? There's still issues, but then mindfulness, again, there's a lot that one has to learn about mindfulness because the mind is so wandering, it's not in the moment. And one often uh, hears this, be in the moment, enjoy the moment. And we can't enjoy the moment. So that's very important. Uh, so the blanks are where, in my view, technology can make a huge contribution. And finally, the ability to receive, release this residue, especially of failure, because not all journeys will be successful. And if a journey is not successful, one feels really bad, and then you dis get disheartened, you don't want to take more journeys, you get, have a sense of despair, you, then you isolate yourself from others, you become lonely, and it has a spiral. Right? So if the journey is not successful, just releasing it, letting it go. Right? That's a very important part, and that, again, technology has not played much of a role. A lot of it is just education, and just understanding, uh, and a lot of it is training. Right? So, so the, here are some of the areas, then in the area of optimism, right? uh, in the area of optimism, technology has not done very much. Right? So it's well known that from a health point of view, from a good living point of view, and a choice between optimism and pessimism is quite clear. If you're optimistic, you try new things, and it just keeps you more open to new opportunities. Right, so optimism. Uh, so with that, you can see areas where we can make a lot of contribution in technology. Now, I'm not going to give you the technology uh, because uh, I have one such technology. Here's a technology which helps me with all of that, but it's just mine. I'm not going to share it with you. Uh, but we will develop technology. So it's guaranteed that smart people in this department, elsewhere, and users who are intelligent and understand the value of good life will drive technology into these areas. It's bound to happen. It's bound. And there's a huge opportunity. And that kind of good life, as I described, is very sustainable. Right? It's very sustainable. So just like if people demand ginger, farmers will grow ginger, which is a wonderful food. So if you don't eat ginger, include ginger in your food. You'll clean your blood. You'll feel really good. Uh, so just like that, if these other things, so just like if you lived in an area where nobody grew ginger, you wouldn't know the value of ginger. Right? So just like that, there are areas, gaps in technology where there is no technology. And it will happen Users will, if the users demand it. So one needs to go from intelligence to wisdom. Right? That's the first. So intelligence to wisdom where some of these gaps will be fulfilled. So awareness of my strengths, awareness of the outer world's challenge, and very importantly, ability to release stress, because stress is there. So stress is always there, ability to release stress. Uh, and just like a farmer planting, understanding what am I planting, and will it grow where I'm planting it, right? So understanding the inner outer world connection. Right? So if the planter, is, this, this farmer is planting rice, and he plants it in an area which doesn't support rice. Right? So there's no water, there's no proper uh, irrigation. You can't grow. So understanding, making that connection uh, is very important. Uh, <clears throat> so personal technology helping our brain take going from intelligence to wisdom. Right? So of course now there's so much technology, I can know so much. But very often, knowledge is not enough. Usually, knowledge is not enough. If you're in a job, knowledge is very important, right? So if you, are, if you have to do something, of course. But in your personal life, very often, knowledge is just one part. Wisdom, which where you start translating your knowledge into something real, that is very difficult. Uh, so there's abundance of information, intelligence, but we are very poor at judging, optimizing paths. At optimizing. Even if you know this is the good path, the moment we get stressed, we are in that other, the primitive brain takes over, and um, <clears throat> so we are very poor at staying mindful, and technologies which will provide us real-time mindfulness and real-time, um, so those technologies are what are needed, and they are very, very possible. Right? So it's not like uh, asking for some uh, a moon for everybody, it's very doable. Although moon is for everybody. Right? So, so intelligence to wisdom, so this is, uh, Mr. Mentor, which is uh, in the Greek mythology, uh, this uh, gentleman who was the guide 
of this prince, I understand. Uh, <clears throat> so technology acting as our personal guide. So that's a goal, right? technology acting like a personal guide, personal guide who will walk with you and constantly help you release stress, whatever, if you're doing something that uh, is not for your own good life, technology that will help guide you through that. Right? Uh, now, if one looks at neuroscience, and neuroscience is doing such amazing things, what they identify is this little uh, almond-like thing called amygdala, which is the source of our primitiveness. Right? So when we are under stress, this part takes over. Right? So whenever we are in stress, all decisions go through the amygdala, which means all decisions go as if we were living 100,000 years ago. Right? So we respond to things as if we were not living today. We are living in a world where there was no food. There were animals all around anxious to take a bite out of us. Uh, there were strangers who were lurking to shoot us, kill us, fear us, do all kind of things. So the primitive part of the brain takes us back 100,000 years and we respond in the same way. And even worse because, of course, at that time of that response may have been appropriate. Right? So it may have been appropriate that if uh, you see a stranger to be fearful, or if you see a wild animal coming to really get angry or mad and drive adrenaline through your body and do something, uh, run or fight or do something. Now that's not needed. Right? So if your boss says something uh, rotten to you, why be angry? You're not going to hit the boss. Right? You don't need that adrenaline running through your body because almost anything you will do will get you fired. Right? <laughs> so today that makes no sense. So today this amygdala is often taking us in down paths that are not appropriate for us. And amygdala is just a technology. Right? So one can also have technology that will help us override some of these things. Uh, and I, I feel very confident considering how bright people are, especially the young people coming up. They'll produce all kind of, so producing a mentor for us. Right? Uh, judging risks for us. Right? So, uh, so sustainable life's journeys convert changing from intelligence to wisdom. So can technology digest information? And of course, technology is fantastic at that. Can do amazing things, do all kind of calculations, optimizations, give us a result. Uh, to find the optimum path. How do I optimize my life journeys? Uh, <clears throat> objectively look at the world, subjectively look at the world, and look at the world from a sustainability point of view. Technology is really fantastic at doing those things. Right? So it can do it. <clears throat> so personal gadgets acting as mentors. Uh, so I'll just very quickly uh, come towards the end. Uh, <clears throat> one of the most, and where technology is going in, is the automobile. So technologies, this kind of technology is coming into the automobile. Uh, <clears throat> where automobile accidents, so this is accidents, so this is from CDC, accidents, unintentional accidents, uh, uh, resulting in death. There are about 123,000 Americans who die every year from accidents. <clears throat> Out of those, about 40,000 are car accidents. And the reason for car accidents is almost always loss of mindfulness. Maybe becoming angry, maybe becoming distracted, uh, looking at your text and texting. So their technology is acting, in fact, in the other direction. Right? So people are texting, they crash into somebody. So uh, recognizing that almost all accidents are preventable from technology, if the technology is designed right. So technology can distract also. Uh, now. <clears throat> the automobile companies are going to put the internet in the car so you can surf the web, you can all do They can do anything they want. They have the technology. They can force the driver to be mindful. Right? And that is slowly starting to happen, which is uh, really good in many ways. So when we look at car crashes, not only 40,000 people die every year. In addition, there are $200 billion of losses from car, car crashes. And other than 1 or 2% of cars, crashes, almost everything is human error uh, induced. We need you to laugh. <laughs> I'm going to I finish up. To my own. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to, dis to distract us. Okay. So, and also, it's interesting that 
if one looks, at our mind is, works often, it fears things that are sometimes very remote, and it's totally happy in situations that are very dangerous. So I just want to show you this plot of, in the US, uh, annual deaths from tornadoes. We are really frightened, frightened by tornadoes. The tornado is coming, we get so excited. Oh, you know, you've got to hide here and there. Uh, every year, about 40 to 50 people die of tornadoes, on an average. That many people die in half a day in car accidents. Because every day, more than 100 Americans die in car crashes. In the whole year, 50 people die from tornadoes. In fact, if you sum all of these weather-related deaths, uh, more people die in car crashes in one week than in a whole year from weather-related disasters. So our brain is not really uh, that bright. We don't understand certain risks, so we fear uh, the unfamiliar. But we haven't seen a tornado, we really fear it, even though it may not be dangerous. <clears throat> we feel very comfortable if in familiar things. We feel very com com familiar in our house, where a lot of falls occur. We feel very familiar in our car, so we feel car driving is very safe. But if you're mindful, of course, it is very safe. <clears throat> <coughs> So coming to uh, technologies, um, and I'll show you this picture, which is from Progressive. It's one of the insurance companies. Uh, and I'm not a spokesperson for an insurance company, but I'll show you because I find it really interesting. Um, <clears throat> so can technology intervene and teach me about foods I eat and how I eat, money I spend and invest, People I trust, education I get, relationships I have. Technology can guide us in all these areas, provided the right kind of technology is developed. And the tools are there, right? tools are there. It's not like entirely new things have to be concocted. For example, Progressive, and this is a auto tracking device. If you go to Progressive, and there are several such insurance companies now, they will cut your insurance by 30, 40, 50% if you let them install this device, and this device, the role of the device is teach you how to drive. It simply keeps track of how you drive, gives you feedback on how you drive, and if you agree to what the thing is saying, you drive very safely. So such technology will intervene in our lives, and it'll come from insurance companies, unfortunately, because they are the ones who assume the risk, and uh, it'll come from healthcare companies, so new technology will come, but such technologies will come in our lives slowly, but as I mentioned to you, they can play a very positive role, and that's an opportunity both for users and technologists to <clears throat> bring good life. Right? So technology, as I said, can be bad, can be good, but in, in some ways can bring this extremely good life to us. So coming back to Moore's Law, I said I'll give you several Moore's Law. Uh, so here are some Moore's Law, which I call Nax Laws, which bring knowledge and action into harmony. Right? So something that brings knowledge and action. So knowledge is there, right? so knowledge is there. Action is not there. So NACT closes that gap. Uh, so one can have Moore's Law, automobile companies and users can produce this Moore's Law that car crashes are halved every two years. So Moore's Law is transistor density is doubled every two years. Here's a law, car crashes are halved every two years. And I think this is an easier law than Moore's law. So car companies can decide we're going to equip the car and take out all distractions from the car because a car crash is not a personal thing. A car crash is a societal thing. You can't say, you know, I'm driving my car, I should, do, I should be able to text because you kill somebody else. So one can have a law like this, but it needs both users and technologists. One can also have laws like diabetes cases are halved every two years. It's entirely doable. It's entirely doable. Or drug addictions are halved every two years. Right? So one can have Moore's-like law because these laws are not natural laws. We're not violating any principles. It's just a matter of people like us and technologists who bring technology getting together and driving the laws. Right? And it's entirely possible. And, uh, Technology is a very powerful behavior modifier. We all know that. You give somebody a cell phone, their behavior completely changes. You give somebody a smartphone, 
Usually it changes in the wrong way, but it changes, right? Uh, and it can change in any way you want. So technology can be designed, um, and that's, I think, an area where technology has, can make a huge con contribution. And also it links humanities and technologies, because there's so much known in humanities about human behavior. And as engineers, we need to learn from humanities what is the human behavior and design technology with help from humanities. Uh, just look at a simple technology like the, the, the indicator for your gas level. Imagine if our cars didn't have this. Right? So imagine if your car did not have this. If you're driving along and how many people will be stranded? If we, and such a simple thing, fuel gauge. If we did not have a fuel gauge, what will have, how, to, how would driving change? And I think there'll be immense money to be made by tow truck drivers, because okay? almost everybody will be stranded. So a simple thing like this, and one can take it to higher levels. Right? So technology that can, just as an example, uh, technology that can observe your distraction level, technology that can observe if you're under stress, if you're angry, if you have road rage, all of these things are detectable. There are sensors out there, there that can, they can do that. Uh, but it's up to us to put them where we need. And this is just an example. There are so many other areas in this area of uh, sustainable good life where we can bring compasses, basically. You know, compass is, of course, an old thing. Uh, but imagine going over in ships all across the oceans not having a compass. Right? So in many ways, we are leading our lives without having a compass. Most important, releasing stress. We have no compass of how to release stress. There's no, not nobody, unless you really go, make an effort, learn certain techniques, uh, but technology is something that can bring that to us. So <clears throat> technology can be an enforcer, like, a, you know, you give me a ticket, uh, stop playing that, like, you know, I wish I had something like this for my <laughs> children. Stop playing that video game or your system will shut down, you know, and it happens, right? If I go and try to shut it down, I get like, it's not easy after that. <laughs> but, uh, so you know, technology can do all this. Um, but this is just a trivial example, technology that can help our good life. So in the next series, also I'll talk about different aspects of where, and the next one is optoelectronics, which is display and imaging, our eyes and light, which is very important uh, because that's a, tremendous guidance systems. Today I talk mainly about intelligence, but what about seeing? And we often talk about seeing uh, normally with our outer eyes. How do you see with your inner eye? Right? So that's a big part of uh, thinking in yoga. How do you see with your inner eye? And what can technology do? Right? So of course, outer eye we understand. Um, so I'm going to end with ha us having all stand up and do this again. And you already know how to do it, so we'll do it for just three breaths. And then uh, I'll welcome some questions if you have. So let's uh, open our chest, bring your hands forward, pulling your shoulders back, stand tall. And then once again, if you really want, you can open your heart. So it's, it's, it's amazing how that can be done, where you open your heart, which means you just release all your burdens from worries and whatever experiments some of you are doing out there, just forget about all that. So let's inhale up. As if you can reach the sky, the clouds, and exhale back, laughing. <laughs> and two more. Really loud. <laughs> and last one. And then just release your shoulders, your back. And you're welcome to ask me questions now, or you can always email me, you can talk to me, and I would love to discuss ideas you have about how you can impact a good life. Thank you.